to battle and this week we're going to be focusing on the the battle in the ministry for for justice and we thank god for all of you who are have joined us this uh, uh first sunday in october october 4th uh the 18th sunday after pentecost and we are still focusing on the ministry and the work of the holy spirit in our lives because I, per, I believe that first the Spirit of God works in us before he works through us. And sometimes he works through us as he works in us. But we are so grateful that day by day, God is continually uh, challenging our hearts and our minds and our spirits and drawing us closer to him. And uh, the ministry of justice is one of those things that it is not just, uh, justice is not just a religious term, but is a very spiritual term. It's a universal term. And when justice gets violated, we not only hear the popular sayings like no justice, no peace, but people from all walks of life, whether they are religious or not, understand uh, the, the history of oppression and the fight to love and care for those who are being oppressed because uh, as we said in the end when there is no justice there is no peace and even our nation the United States of America was born uh, because of a system of oppression and uh, as we look into some of the political uh, and social sides of justice, we will see how central that is to not only the heart of human beings, but the heart of God. And God calls us to provide justice and, and, and be actively engaged in uh, the ministry of justice. With that being said, let us look at the Word of God. We're going to be looking at Micah chapter 6, uh, the first eight verses, and then we're going to be um, uh, uh, going into the scriptures, uh, various scriptures that I have found uh, that talks about uh, justice and uh, how it plays in the heart of, of God. Um, before we uh, read that scripture, I also want to announce a prayer request that I received this week uh, from uh, regarding Michael Delk, uh, uh, and Brother Delk had cataract surgery on, on Wednesday and uh, suffered some complications, and the family is asking for prayer. So let us definitely keep uh, Brother Michael Delk uh, lifted up in prayer. And I also want to announce to uh, the Bethlehem family, if you do indeed have a, a prayer request or perhaps a praise report that you want to, to share, we ask that you get those uh, prayer requests to our tech team by Thursday, or you can also go through Sister Doris Shields. Uh, let them receive it by Thursday so they'll have plenty of time to uh, uh, add it to one of our slides uh, each week. But we want to uh, make sure we don't let any of your prayer requests drop through the cracks. So please get those prayer requests uh, out to our um, uh, tech teams. Amen. All right. Listen for the word of the Lord. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusations. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a, a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you. 
also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak said of Moab when he plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, said, answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilga, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The word of God for the people of God. Before, before I get into some of the uh, messages, uh, if the <clears throat> tech team can jump over a couple of slides to that litany of uh, scriptures that talks about uh, justice. The uh, just uh, go on to the next one, to the next one. Okay, so um, this scripture is one of those scriptures where I noticed uh, there were several scriptures that talks about justice in the Bible, and I want to show that uh, to you. The first one, the Lord executes. Uh, justice, uh, uh, righteousness, and justice for all who were oppressed were, uh, the, was the scripture that was seen last um, Sunday when we talked about the benefits that come from God. That was in Psalms 103 uh, and verse 6. And I said that I would use that as a jump off to also talk about other scriptures that talks about justice in the Bible. And as we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, it talks about the rock, our God, whose work is perfect. And uh, for all God's ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is God. And in Psalms 89, it talks about righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. And I think that's very important to uh, uh, highlight a couple of things that you see recurrent in the word of God. And that's the relationship between justice and the love of God. You will see that theme, justice as uh, uh, viewed in uh, God's people being oppressed or vulnerable being oppressed, and the love of God that wants to overcome this thing called injustice. So in Psalms 82, it says, give justice to the weak. And the fatherless maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Isaiah chapter 1, learn to do good. That's God speaking to us. This is something that we need to learn and to seek justice. Justice is not something that is just going to always find you or be knocking at your door. Justice is something that we have to learn to do and to learn to seek. And when we find it, according to Isaiah chapter one, it says we need to correct oppression and bring justice to the fatherless. Justice is not just going to show up. It's something that we have to seek, we have to correct, and we have to bring to those who are vulnerable and please 
the widows caused the fatherless or the orphans and the widows, they were often the most vulnerable of the society and they were vulnerable for people to take advantage and take them and use them for what even little they have. And the last two that I want to highlight is, uh, I'm going to first start with Amos uh, chapter 5, that uh, scripture on the bottom where God says, I hate, listen, we're talking about the God of love now, and the God of love is telling us something that he hates. I hate your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your hearts, but let justice roll down like a river, righteousness like a mighty stream. We know that was a, a popular phrase during Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. He got that from Amos. And it start, that scripture starts out talking about all the religious folks doing all their religious assemblies, their sacrifices, their offerings, they sing their songs. And it's just like us in the church, Sunday after Sunday, we come together, we worship, we give our offerings, our tithes, and we do all these religious things, but we neglect justice. And Amos says, justice needs to roll down like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. And lastly, in that um, scripture in uh, Luke chapter 11, you see Jesus condemning the Pharisees. Uh, that scripture, that, really, that, that verse right there, where it says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue of every herb and neglect justice and neglect the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, listen to how Jesus rebuked them. Jesus said that they were neglecting justice. When we think of someone neglecting their child, what we often think of is you may not be actively abusing them and beating them, but if you don't feed them, if you don't provide shelter for them, if you don't close them, if you let them be dirty, people often will say you are neglecting your child. When you neglect your marriage, you may not be cheating on your wife or beating her or you paying the bills, but if you're not taking care of her and honoring and respecting her, you are neglecting her humanity. Jesus was using this terminology when he was talking about justice. So you're doing all those other good things. You're paying your tithe. You're going to church. You're assembling together. You're singing beautiful songs. However, you are neglecting not only justice, but you are neglecting the love of God. Because it is God's, the purpose of God's love is to reach those who are hurting, just like the love of God reached you one day and reached me one day. And we celebrate the love of God. We cherish the love of God. We thank God every day for the love of God in our lives. But God is saying, I want to use that same love and reach those who are being oppressed, those who are not experiencing justice in their lives. They don't know me because they don't see me through the love of God that should be extended to them through you and through me. So this is why Jesus was condemning the religious leaders because they were more focused on the showmanship of religion 
and doing all the church stuff, the synagogue stuff, but the love of God, which is the more weightier matters, the things that are most important to God, they were neglecting. But I want to emphasize the fact that those are the things, the religious stuff is good. He was not condemning that. In, all, in, 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 in um, other words, he was actually saying, you ought to do those things. I want you to go to church. I want you to study the Bible. I want you to pay your tithe to support the ministry. I want you to do all those things. But those are the foundations to help us be channels of the ministry of justice for the world. And that first scripture in Micah chapter 1 verse uh, 8, it is really funny because I need you to hear a couple of very sarcastic things because it started out by saying, uh, listen to what God is saying. Stand up and plead my case before the mountains and let the hills hear what you have to say. Now, if you ever been in the sermon and you heard the, sermon, the, the preacher say, amen lights, hello walls, Okay, pews, can I get a witness, pews? That is what a, uh, Micah is saying in this is scripture. He says, listen, I can't talk to the people right now, so let me talk to the mountains. Because if these mountains can talk and tell what's been going on among my people, you will understand the challenge that the Lord is dealing with. But here is the sarcasm that was being hurled at God. Look at starting with verse six. He's, they, the people were saying, man, what do I need to do to please God? Do I need to come with, to God with all these burnt offerings with new calves? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? How many rams do I have to kill so that God will be satisfied? Or shall I, uh, or shall I give the Lord 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Is that what God needs? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? Can, can you see the, the sarcasm dripping and the self-righteousness dripping from their face? The fruit of my body, do I have to give that for, for, for God to be satisfied? And I think that's the way we are today. We try to make salvation and forgiveness and the love of God so melodramatic and complicated. But how, look how he answers in verse 8. Stop the drama, people. God has already shown you what is good. You want to know what the Lord requires of us today in our day-to-day -day lives? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. If you can figure that out, everything else will fall in line because God wants us to act justly in how we interact with our fellow human beings. It's not all about all this, oh, I got to sacrifice so much for God. No, you don't. Just act justly. Love mercy. Fall in love with mercy. The same mercy that we were begging for when we first got saved. And when we first had that, wanted a relationship with God, we were begging God be mercy. We wasn't calling for justice then, were we? Because justice means you get what you deserve, good or bad. But many of us was looking at our own lives and say, God, I don't, want, I don't want justice. I want mercy. Because if you gave me what I deserve, I would never make it in. Because every time I take one step forward in God, I end up taking two steps back because I'm struggling in this body called sin and I'm struggling to get better. But because of the mercy of God, I am where I am today. Because of the mercy of God, I have what I have today. So I'm not even asking for justice, God. I'm asking for mercy in my life. And God is saying, love mercy. 
love it so much that you want to receive it every day and love it so much that you want to give it every day, that you want to share it every day. Live with your children with, through eyes and lives and a heart of mercy. Live with your spouse through eyes and mind and a heart of mercy. And you will see how much better life for not only you will be, but for everybody would be in your life if your life is one of love and mercy and walking justly. Give people, stop oppressing others and give them the justice that they need to live right. And justice in the Bible, you see, is always connected with oppression. Because you notice that I stopped at verse 8, but now could the tech team, can you go um, on back to Micah chapter 6, where I started at verse 9? Amen for our tech team. You guys rock. Okay, so look at look at this one. Uh, you go back to that to the next uh, slide right there. So it says, listen, after he just told you to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, now God's saying, all right, you came at me with all that melodrama, but let me, let me get real with you for a minute, O oh people of God. Listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and, and to fear God's name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house? Am I to forget the short ephah, which is a curse? Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent. Your inhabitants are liars and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, in other words, this is the reason why I have become, I begun to destroy you and to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat, but not be satisfied. Remember we were talking last week about how because of the benefits of God, I am so satisfied. See, this is the opposite when we neglect justice and we allow uh, oppression. It says you will eat, but will not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up, but save nothing. Because what you save, I will give to the sword. You will plant, but not harvest. You will press olives but not have any oil. You would crush grapes, but not drink wine. I want to end right there because listen to what God is saying in, uh, in this passage. God is saying, you are accusing me of not doing right by you. You are accusing me of not blessing you, even though you've done all these religious things. But am I Am I supposed to forget this oppression that you have been doing? All you got your riches through ill-gotten ways. You have been using dishonest, dishonest scales, dishonest measurements. So, in other words, you were cheating people to get rich. And I'm supposed to forget about that. You see, when you cheat people so that you can be rich then that is what we call oppression because you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We'll get into the political side later. But because of folks who are in positions of power who are cheating you and taking more than they deserve and blocking you from being the full you that you can be, God is saying, Am I supposed to forget about that? You have been oppressing others and neglecting the love of God and taking advantage of people, and I'm supposed to just look the other way. Did you forget that I said you will reap 
what you sow. So I am seeing you oppress others, take advantage of those who are under your political charge, and I'm supposed to just forget about that and bless you anyhow. God is saying no. So in this scripture, God is specifying his case against the people of Israel. And he says, what I need you to do, starting with verse four in Micah chapter six, he says, I want you to remember what I have done for you. You're talking about I burden you and I have done something horrible to you. But look what he says. You remember, don't you remember I brought you out of Egypt? and redeemed you from the land of slavery? Did you forget that, that I didn't leave you there? And I, I need you to understand is this is one of the funniest things about religious folks is how the very same ones who were delivered from slavery and oppression, once they are in a position of freedom can turn right around and oppress and enslave others. That has been one of the biggest sins even of America. We don't have time to go into all of that this week and that's why I want to kind of break this message off into two parts or I'll have you here a morning. But I wanna talk about that history where the same folks who were celebrating victory and fought wars to gain the victory over slavery, over tyranny, over oppression, once they are in position of power now, can turn right around and find all kinds of folks to oppress, to enslave, and to keep down and actually use those people to enrich themselves. And God is saying in, in the book of Micah, do you think I don't know about it? Do you think I can forget about that? He said, I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam to guide you. And verse five, remember my people, what Balak king of Moab plotted and what Balaam son of Beor answered. For those of you who remember that story in the Old Testament, it was when the king, Balak, hired this man of God called Balaam to curse the people of Israel. And those of you who remember this story, three times the king asked him to curse them, but in turn he blessed them. And Balak got angry and said, look, Balak, um, look, Balaam, I will give you gold. I will pay you because I know you, that you have this reputation. Whoever you curse will be cursed and whoever you bless will be blessed. So you, man of God, if you can just curse these people for me. Now, I, I understand this is hard for you, many of you to understand because you know, this was a political figure, a king, using religious leaders to oppress and curse people because we, we can't see a king or president using religious leaders today <laughs> to actually be a, a, a source of oppression for people. So you got, I'm, I'm asking you to use your imagination a little bit, but these were, but, but Balaam in the end said, I can only speak what God told me to speak. And God said, these people are blessed. So, oh, King, oh, Mr. President, no matter how much you try to bless me and give me positions of power, the only thing that's going to come out of my mouth is what thus saith the Lord, and these are blessed folks. And I need you to understand believers, that you are some blessed folks. And even though sometimes the political leaders will try to curse you and use the evangelicals or anybody else to curse you, you are still blessed. 
And I like it when, when Balaam even tried, God put an angel with a sword in front of that donkey, and that donkey had enough sense to say, nah, nah bro, you're on your own with this one, <laughs> because these folks are blessed, and I'm not going through this angel with a flaming sword. And if you remember, uh, Balaam was talking about, donkey, if you don't keep taking me out the path, I wish I had a sword and I would cut you. And the, the donkey was like, well, this dude already got a sword, <laughs> and I have got to obey God. If a donkey have enough sense to obey God, why couldn't the man of God who was supposed to speak for God? So he learned his lesson the hard way, and I do believe in the year 2020, there's going to be some religious leaders who are going to have to account for getting bed with some of these political leaders and speaking things over the lives of black folks, speaking the lives of all kinds of church folks that were not from the words of God. He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love mercy, don't be arrogant about it. I mean, it's, it's easy to be arrogant when you are a child of the king. <laughs> Come on now. When God keeps blessing you, it's easy to walk with your head up high and your backbone straight. And you ought to think highly of yourself, but not more highly than you ought to. You ought to, but not more highly than you ought to. That's what the Bible says when it when it said, means when it says, walk humbly with God, because it's going to take a humble spirit to do the things that God wants to get done. When you are living and working and serving day by day around the orphans, around the homeless, you know, it, it takes humility to go around people who are living under I-25 and I- 285 living in tents but a humble person can walk into those places and say you know what i just want to bring you the love of god i want to let you know that god is thinking about you god cares about you and god is humble enough to be where you are god is not just waiting for you to come out and find him god is coming to you you see, a humble people can bring justice and relieve the oppression of those who are suffering by going anywhere. I remember back in, in, the, in the 80s when those who had suffered the disease of AIDS and those who had a humble heart said, you know what, I am not afraid to come to where you are and hold your hand and share the love of God, because I hear even the religious folks talking down to you and acting like God doesn't love you. But all oh, those who had a heart, a humble heart for God said, no, God loves you. And God is a merciful God. And God can bring healing here even in the age wars. It takes a humble heart to know who you are and to receive the love of God so that you can offer the love of God to those who are hurting. Today, I just focused on the spiritual aspects of justice. Next week, I'm going to go into a little bit more of the historical and the legal side of it. And that's why, Tech Team, can you just sh uh, show that one scripture about the U.S. Constitution, not the scripture, but the passage from the U.S. Constitution, because I want you to see this, and I want you to look not only that, but take the time just to read the Declaration of Independence. Take the time to look at the Pledge of Allegiance, and also take the time to look at this one opening to the U.S. Constitution before there was the Articles, before there was the Bill of Rights, 
before there was all the amendments that we know about, this is how the US Constitution opened. It says, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. I need you to understand that because all of the articles of the Constitution, all of the amendments of the Constitution, the foundation of it was the purpose of the Constitution was to establish justice, to ensure the domestic tranquility. That's another word of saying peace. So if you don't have justice, no wonder you don't have domestic tranquility or peace because you failed in the first aspect of it. And we also know because of the many compromises that were, were made in the execution of the Constitution, because of the compromise and the lack of justice for many of the people of the United States, it eventually led to yet another war called the Civil War. But I just wanted to highlight that as an introduction of what we're going to be sharing and focusing on next week, the fact that the whole purpose of the Constitution, and I'm going to be a little bit of a history nerd, because, but I want you to understand it is because of the Constitution and the way it was written that Thurgood Marshall, that Martin Luther King, and many of the civil rights attorneys, many of the women in the suffrage movements, because of the way the Constitution was written, it gave them the legal and the moral authority to establish justice for specific groups of people. So I want you to look at look at that, the fact that the very first thing that the Constitution talks about is establishing justice, what it means, what it does not mean. And as we go through it, it will help us to understand why even we today are pleading with those who are marching don't riot, don't use violence, don't try to attack police officers, all these things that they are doing that is causing us to lose the moral and the spiritual ground that we have to demand and fight for justice. So this was a foundation, the spiritual foundation, but I ask, please look at the the um, opening of the Constitution, even though it's a little bit long, read the Declaration of Independence because you will be thinking as you read it, was this 17 something or was this 20, 20 something? You will see some parallel goings on and it will help us as we look at the heart of God see that justice truly is a ministry. Amen. So I want to leave it at that. It was kind of an odd ending to this week's message, but I, I wanted to focus on, on that uh, as 